Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for August 11th, 2020. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity of X Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Uh, today's topic is Transitioning Cybersecurity Research to Practice, Success Stories and Tools You Can Use with Florence Hudson, Ryan Kaiser, Patrick Trainer, and Jay Yang. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. Um, and you can, just, you, you can find the chat box by clicking it and it'll pop up. Um, we would like to uh, take uh, questions at the end of the presentation because we have many speakers. And so uh, we will be monitoring the chat for the questions and we'll try to get through them at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will hand things over to Florence. Florence, welcome. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jeanette. Jay, next chart, please. And so welcome to this webinar. And this is the Transitioning Cybersecurity Research to Practice Success Stories and Tools webinar. And we're delighted to have all the speakers we have and everyone who's joined us today. Next chart, please. So our agenda today is I'll do a little overview of the cybersecurity uh, TTP program that we have at Trusted CI and an overview of some of the success stories that we've been chronicling and putting on the website this year. Then we have two of our researchers presenting, both NSF funded researchers that have successfully transitioned to practice or in the process of successfully transitioning to practice. We thought it would be interesting for you to hear both views, you know, looking back, looking forward and in the middle of it. So first, Patrick Trainer is going to present Skim Reaper, his TTP success story. Patrick is from the University of Florida. And then Jay Yang from the Rochester Institute of Technology is going to talk about his tool, Assert. Um, then we're going to talk about our brand new TTP playbook, which we're announcing today and is available on our website at trustedci.org slash TTP. And Ryan Kaiser is going to present the TTP TRL assessment tool, which is technology readiness level. And I'll present the TTP canvas, both tools that you can use in your TTP journey. And then we're going to talk about the Trusted CI TTP cohort and welcome you to join us if you'd like. Next chart, please. A little overview of cybersecurity transition to practice in the program at Trusted CI, the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. We started this journey um, under the NSF grant at um, the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence at uh, Trusted CI a couple years ago. And what our goal is and what we do is we enable researcher and practitioner collaboration to accelerate cybersecurity research to practice. And research to practice can be in academia, it could be industry, it could be government, it could be open source. There are many different vehicles. And part of what we want to make clear is that it's not like there's just one little recipe. You know, everyone has a different view, everyone has a different goal, and their, um, their research has a different journey it needs to take to go all the way to operationalization. And so it's the diversity that I think is very interesting and can give you each comfort that there's a, there could be an answer for you. So we do researcher and practitioner matchmaking, and you'll hear about some of those examples today. Um, we have the technology readiness level or TRL assessments and coaching that Ryan Kaiser leads for us. We have business model coaching that I do. This is Florence Hudson. And this year, we created this trusted CI TTP cohort. Um, and we had our first two people we called TTP fellows, and, and they really helped us craft this whole program. Um, Jay Yang, who's speaking today, was our first TTP fellow in the cohort. And then Shantanu Chakrabarti from Washington and St. Louis um, was the second, and one of his students joined us as well. And we're looking to grow this cohort. So that's what we're going to talk about toward the end. Um, we also this year have the new TTP success stories blog. When I first got started with this TTP journey a few years ago when Anita Nikolich was at NSF and we talked about it, we were set, I asked like, so give me some TTP success stories. And the one that everybody knew about was Bro, which is now called Zeke. Um, but there weren't many others that came to mind for people. And I thought, wow, you know, we need to find some more. So um, we found 
found a number of them, and we have them on the TTP Success Stories blog at trustedci.org slash TTP, and two of them are speaking today, which is exciting. And we have another one coming out from Shantanu Chakrabarthi uh, this month. Um, and then we have this new TTP plague, book, which we're really excited about. You know, as Ryan and I were crafting the TTP plan for this year, we were saying, you know, let's, let's give them some tools they can use. And so I really want to thank Jay and Shantanu, our, our to first two TTP cohort members to help in helping us craft this, you know, coming up with the TRL assessment, um, customizing the TTP canvas. And so we'll talk more about that, but it, what we're, we're very focused on what you all need, you know, what your journey looks like and helping you get there. Next chart, please. So these are some of the success stories on our blog. Uh, the first one we posted this year was from Mayank Varia at Boston University. And they actually have secure multi-party computation software. And they worked with the city of Boston and the Boston Women's Workforce Council to do a gender pay gap analysis in a privacy preserving way, um, which was really interesting and exciting. And their model is open source. Their, their code is on GitHub, it comes in different versions, and they have industry partners that invest in their research, um, but it's, you know, it's up on uh, GitHub and open source. Um, the next one um, that we had posted this year is simplifying scientist access to cyber infrastructure with CI Logon and James Basney from University of Illinois um, at Urbana-Champaign and the National Center for Supercomputing Applications actually is the, uh, is the scientist, the researcher there. And that is very well known, um, especially in higher ed. And so they actually have a, a business model and a revenue model that goes along with that for um, quite a targeted focus um, area. And you could read more about these on the Success Stories blog. The two presenters we have today were our next two uh, success stories. Uh, Patrick Trainer from University of Florida on securing payment readers with Skim Reaper. And he has a very interesting story, uh, all the way from research to you know, practical application out in the field and talking to his users and a great story. And then um, Jay Yang from RIT, as I mentioned, will be talking about using machine learning to aid in the fight against cyber attacks. So what I'd like to do now is pass it off to Patrick and uh, Jay's gonna stop sharing his screen and Patrick is going to start sharing his through the power of multimedia and the internet. And here we go. Patrick, take it away. Hey Florence, thanks so much. And thanks everybody for tuning in today. Uh, again, my name is Patrick Trainer, and I'm a professor at the University of Florida. Um, this is actually my third startup based on my research uh, uh, as a faculty member. And I kind of wanna share you know what we've been doing and some of the both the triumphs and the, the challenges that we've been facing uh, and try and cram all that into 20 minutes. So um, with that, I'm going to tell you about our device, the Skim Reaper, which is designed to find credit card skimmers uh, in uh, a variety of payment terminals. But before I do that, I want to talk about innovation in general. Now, 10 years ago, uh, if I had asked you to innovate over the, the humble wheel, um, I bet the folks who are tuned into this call could have come up with some amazing things, right? It's, it's not hard to, um, to appreciate the genius of the wheel and uh, with smart people, maybe we can do better than, uh, than what we have. And you would probably come up with ideas like this. This is a, a twheel. The twheel is extra lightweight uh, and it never goes flat because it doesn't have any air. You might've come up with something a little more ruggedized that could intentionally become misshapen uh, and be used over all sorts of different terrains. Perhaps you would have gone the Mars rover approach, abandoned uh, rubber altogether and, and used a metallic mesh instead. Or finally, you might've just thrown out the whole concept of the circle and gone with the square wheel. As you can see, that's a, a pretty cheap thing. Um, all you have to do is just replace the thing that it's riding over. Now, I wanna point out that while all of these innovations are really fantastic, they miss out on a lot of important points. And one of the big ones is every single one of these things is, uh, except the square wheel, of course, is much more expensive and doesn't last nearly as long as the wheels we have now. And the other is that they largely ignore deployed infrastructure. And this is the Eisenhower uh, highway system in the United States. Uh, were you to go the square wheel tack, uh, you would have to find a way to repave all of these major roads and certainly all of the, the byways as well. So I'd argue that this is what innovation would look like. This is a, a run flat tire with TPMS, it's a tire pressure management system. Not only does it 
uh, alert you when your tire is losing pressure, but it lets you get 50 miles to solve the problem. What do tires have to do with, uh, with credit card fraud? Well, we as academics are always hitting hard on the concept of novelty and innovation is really one of the crown jewels uh, in evaluating each other's work. But innovation uh, and writing a paper alone does not mean that the problem is fixed. I'm certain you all could come up with a thing that could be used in isolated contexts that would be better than the tires that I've shown you. And yet, which one of these things actually got deployed? So what I want you to think about today and as you go forward is how are you going to overcome massively and quite costly deployed infrastructure as you consider uh, bringing your state of the art to practice? All right, so I'd like to start off with just a quick overview about uh, credit cards. And if you ask most academics, unfortunately, what they'll tell you is, look, credit card fraud is a solved problem. Uh, that, that arrow is pointing to a little chip that is uh, called the EMV or EuroPay uh, MasterCard and Visa chip. Uh, it's on virtually all of our cards now. Look, we've applied cryptography so what could possibly go wrong? And in fact, oftentimes when I talk to my European friends, they sort of laugh at how far behind the times their American colleagues are because we still have the magnetic stripe. Well, let me reassure you of a few things. Every European colleague who I've had a, that conversation with still has the magnetic stripe on the back of their card. And that ATM skimmers are alive and well <laughs> across the world. But if that isn't enough to convince you, understand that we've known since 2010 that this standard is broken, demonstrably broken. It also doesn't take into account the reality of deploying real systems. For example, if you go to a store and your chip card doesn't work, what's the fallback? It's still your magnetic stripe. What about gift cards that are set up to be used a single time and can still have a large amount of money on them? It turns out in reality, if you're a vendor, you want to accept as many kinds of payments as possible. And that humble magnetic stripe is not going anywhere. So appreciating that this magnetic stripe is going to be around for a very long time, what do we do about it? Because if you talk to people who are in law enforcement, in retail, in uh, the financial industry, credit card fraud, in particular credit card skimming, represents a major, major problem that they're dealing with even today. In fact, by the way, even in the pandemic that we're in, uh, industries that have managed to stay open have seen a massive uptick in the number of skimmers that they're finding on premises. So let's talk briefly about what skimmers are. They come in lots of forms. You've probably seen these overlays and they're on everything from external payment terminals at an ATM to even inside the stores themselves. So when someone tells you to go inside because it's safer, they don't necessarily know what they're talking about. They can be, uh, and these are the really tricky ones, they're called deep inserts. This is slid directly into the payment card slot and there's nothing to see, there's nothing to feel, it's essentially invisible. Uh, again, if you don't believe uh, me that EMV is broken uh, and attacked, there are EMV based shimmers, uh, the skimmers as well. These are designed to, uh, to try and, um, and get the information they need uh, there. There are direct wiretaps. Believe it or not, not, not every ATM uses end-to-end -end encryption. And there are some that are placed inside of uh, gas pumps. Now the whole purpose of skimming is data acquisition. And again, you wanna copy as much information as, as necessary to either clone a card or make a uh, card not present transaction when you're doing online payments. So what did the state of the art look like when we started this work? It was incredibly basic. We went and talked to folks in retail and they said that on occasion they'd have their employees use a ruler. And if, if uh, a payment terminal was one eighth of an inch larger than it was supposed to be, then there was a problem. You can imagine in a retail setting who has time to do it that carefully. You've all certainly heard, well, just tug on the card acceptor before you, uh, you put your card in. These things from our experience in the field are generally, um, they generally have to be pried off by the folks who put them there because they don't want to lose their equipment. So I'm not telling you not to do it, but what I am telling you to do is don't believe that this is um, necessary and sufficient to protect yourself. Tamper evidence seals, we in security know that uh, these are of limited value. And we've certainly seen in the state of Florida that um, in a paper we published a few years ago, that uh, over 80% of the gas pumps in which skimmers were found had unbroken seals on them. 
and um, you know, and the list goes on and on, Bluetooth detectors, uh, et cetera. The short answer is not much of this stuff works well at all. So we came up with a simple hypothesis and we focused on, uh, on the overlay and deep, deep insert skimmers. And those uh, are the most common uh, of the type of skimmers and they work as follows. They add an additional read head to the track. So if we can count the number of times that a card is being read, then we know when it's too many and we can sound an alarm. Now this again, it's a very high level view of what we do. We have to actually know something about the physics uh, and how everything works. For instance, that read head has got to be touching because uh, the, uh, the field intensity is uh, incredibly low. If you read any uh, card reader documentation, um, they make sure that the, their read head touches. The bad guys have got to make sure that theirs does too. So it's got to touch. The surface has to be uh, conductive um, in a very specific way. Uh, and it's got to be a certain minimal size. This is the track size uh, in order to, uh, uh, to work. So knowing that, we're able to come up with a device that essentially measures these properties against uh, a skimmer. If it's going to work, it has to do these things. And therefore we can uh, measure for the presence of, uh, of a device that's doing this. And we started in our lab, we were, uh, we initially were laser etching um, uh, some boards. Uh, the, you know, students were 3D printing components. Uh, it was really, to be honest, one of the most fun times in my academic career because each day we were, uh, you know, custom making new pieces of hardware in order to try and really uh, have a, a reliable tool to detect these things. And we tested them across all sorts of uh, real systems. And what we ultimately came up with was this. Um, then we partnered with the NYPD and did a, uh, with their financial crimes task force. And we did a ride along in Manhattan. Um, ultimately, uh, we left five of our devices uh, with, uh, with that group. And they were ultimately able to make an arrest and conviction um, on an ATM in one of the five boroughs. So they were actually able to do a stakeout after the fact um, and then um, arrest and convict the person who had placed the skimmer and had come back to retrieve it. So when that happened, um, things kind of blew up quickly for us. And we, we realized that in spite of what our academic colleagues were saying, that folks needed reliable tools. Uh, they needed ways that their employees with minimal training could go out and find such devices. And so we had to go back to the drawing board a little bit. That device I just showed you, uh, again, it took about 15 hours to make. My students still probably have the soldering burns on their fingers uh, because we had thousands of requests uh, almost overnight to make more of them. It also taught us a, a lot about what we as uh, scientists and engineers thought was a sufficient design and what actual users wanted. And one example you can still see here, there was this um, uh, USB cable uh, that was connected between this box and the card. And what we found is that when we gave this out, it worked fine for us because we gave the equipment uh, white glove treatment when we were using it, but most other people you know, used it in a, a less careful fashion. And so the board would, uh, would come, up, uh, come apart from uh, the cable. So we spent the better part of a year um, taking all that feedback and then moving into this design here. And this is actually our commercial product, uh, the Skim Reaper. We, la we launched commercially at the end of last August. Uh, and uh, the device is simple enough to use. You click that button that's on the left-hand side of the black box. Uh, it, that tells it to start looking. Uh, you dip or swipe as necessary. And then you click the button again to say stop reading. You get a blue light uh, that tells you if everything is okay. And you get a red light that tells you if there's a problem. And by the way, um, just as a personal note, folks who are doing UI design, uh, I'm red, green, colorblind. I hate red and green uh, LEDs. And so we tried to take my own uh, user challenges and, and make sure that our device was clear and easy to use for everybody. Um, in that time, by the way, we're deployed in uh, 20 states. We have uh, paying customers in, uh, in 20 states. Uh, and um, we're working with um, financial the financial industry, um, you know, large and small banks, uh, retail. We're working with law enforcement, uh, federal, state, and local. Uh, and we keep growing because it turns out that this is a massive problem.
This infrastructure is everywhere and we're not just gonna rip it out overnight. So very briefly, I wanna talk about a handful of the challenges and I've, I've hinted at some of them, right? Uh, building our own device, it took a lot of time. It, uh, it didn't conform to how actual customers were going to use it. Um, but I want to talk about a couple of other things. And these are a bit sensitive, um, so I want to try and um, address them. I also encourage you, if you have more questions, to please follow up with me afterwards. Now, the first is one of the conflicts is often universities. And it really depends on sort of how forward looking your university is. Some universities, and mine wasn't, uh, mine hasn't been, uh, but discussing this with others have, um, have argued that tr the transition to practice can conflict with your responsibilities and uh, it might get in the way of publishing papers. My pushback, uh, to be honest with you, is that's, that is uh, too short-sighted and that actually deploying something will give you great data to build even better solutions uh, and that ultimately, you know, we answer to the general uh, public here in the United States. We need to be providing them with artifacts that are useful and evidence that their investment in computer science and computer security in particular is paying off. So long term, you might get some pushback from administrators. I strongly encourage you advocate for yourself. Define what uh, impact is to you and tell your dean, your chair, you know, whomever needs to hear it that transition to practice is absolutely a critical portion of academia. It's not enough to write uh, to just write a paper. That's a great start. Uh, the next thing that we we rarely talk about is patents, and most folks haven't had much training in this process. But I'll tell you, uh, two weeks ago I was on a call with a customer, and about the third question was, "Well, what's your intellectual property here? Uh, if you don't have patent protection for your innovations, even seemingly small things, then it's very easy for someone else uh, to take what you're doing and with more money and engineers, just build it. And uh, I mean, it's great that it's getting out there, but your control, your ability to actually uh, deliver the solution uh, disappears. The other thing too is, and again, people don't often see this, but big companies, uh, if you don't have intellectual uh, property protection, uh, they risk getting sued by somebody else who might have something that's close. So not having a patent uh, can actually be very costly and will end many conversations. That said, uh, this process, it's going to need your oversight. Uh, and the licensing process from your university, uh, quite frankly, uh, can be a nightmare. And it's going to take a lot of time um, and a lot of money. And that brings me into our, our next piece, and that's funding. And again, here's where I want to be the most sensitive because uh, myself, my students are extraordinarily fortunate. We've done very well at the National Science Foundation and we've produced some of the top graduates and I believe research uh, in my career. Uh, this particular work I think has been a tremendous success. And again, I point to that map of in under a year, uh, we are deployed in, uh, in 20 different states. We applied for SATSE core funding uh, for this work in uh, really 2018 and that was rejected okay well we were moving forward anyway so we said well we're going to go for an sbir in this space and we were rejected in 2019 because it was uh, not creative original or potentially transformative uh two weeks ago uh, we have a a new thing that we're working on and um, it it looks for other types of skimmers uh, very principled, like the Skim Reaper. We actually applied to the SATSE TTP program. And if it's on this slide, you can guess that it's uh, probably not good news. That was rejected too. And it was rejected by academics who said EMV solves all of these problems. So this is a struggle. Again, I'm on my third startup and this piece is still a struggle. The next bit of advice I'm gonna give you it will seem insensitive, but it's sort of necessary. And that is, have $60,000 sitting around. If that's a hurdle, and I know it is for a lot of people, uh, then you know, work, we've got to work on this process. We've got to find ways for TTP uh, to be you know, even better funded and more accessible because it's a strong belief of mine that ultimately this work doesn't do us a lot of good if it all sits on the shelf. That even in the face of all of these challenges, things you almost certainly were not trained for as a graduate student or in that brief faculty introduction most of you got, 
the world needs you to bring these creations to market, whatever that market is. So let me just wrap up here and, and go back to the wheel. Innovation is so important. And again, every single person on this call is incredibly creative and could certainly come up with something that would work better than uh, the wheel on their, on their car in certain circumstances. But just writing a paper, just innovating by itself, that's the first step. Innovation by itself doesn't fix the problems. Citing each other's papers, that's the easy part. It's the transition to practice that's beginning of, uh, the beginning of where the really hard work has to be done. And again, I'm so glad that I've been able to do this multiple times in my career. And I, as I spend the last weeks of my summer here writing tenure letters, I tell you that the strongest letters I write are always for the people who take these kinds of risks. That said, you need to have a plan to replace or displace deployed systems. Again, if you, if you don't believe me in the context of credit card readers, believe me, you know, referring to IPv6 or secure solutions for DNS or BGP, a lot of these big things get rolled out quickly. There, there's no flag day. There's no, we're gonna rip out the internet we have and start with a new one. It's hard to get traction. And so you need to have a plan, right? I mean, if we could replace all of the highways uh, so that that square wheel would work, okay, it might be practical. Otherwise, it's just a bit of a curiosity. The last thing is, again, I'm a huge fan of this program. Reach out to others, learn from our mistakes. I think I put some of them pretty prominently on, that, uh, on this slide here, and make the world better, because that's ultimately what this program is about. Again, I'm Patrick Trainer. You can find me on Twitter, at skimreaper.com or at the University of Florida. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Florence. Oh, thank you, Patrick. That was so inspirational. God bless you for, you keep going, right? You're like the Energizer Bunny. You just keep going. And I think that's one of the, you know, the messages with TTP. It is a journey. Uh, you know, when we really first started the, the TTP assessments, you know, a, a number of years ago, when I first had an eager in my last role um, for TTP, and we spoke to the Bro and Zeke team, and it took them, you know, 10, 15, 17 years to actually get it to the point that it really could be deployed widely um, and have like a business model associated with it. It's a long journey. And one of the patterns we see is what you said, Patrick, is how important it is to listen to the user, watch how the user is trying to interact with it, and then figure out how to make it more valuable. And that's so important. And that's really one of the keys of getting the research out of the lab and into somebody else's hands that can use it is understanding that transition, not just the transition of the research, but into the hands of real users. Um, and that's a pattern um, that I see very often. And actually, I think Jay's going to talk about that too. So um, thank you. That was great. And Patrick is going to stay on the line. If you have any questions for him, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the, of, of the presentations. So now I'd like to ask Jay Yang, who's been graciously projecting for us because a lot of us are having power problems due to all the storms going on. So thank God we're a great team here. Um, and so Jay is at Rochester Institute of Technology, and he's doing some very cool work in artificial intelligence and machine learning for cybersecurity. So Jay, we'd love to hear your story. Thank you, Florence. Uh, Patrick, that was a great presentation story. I really echo a lot about the infrastructure comment. And I'll add to that, it's not just the hardware infrastructure, but also the software and also the human infrastructure that makes it very challenging to do transition to practice. I, I also really like uh, your comments about the funding side. I, I definitely can chat more about it. <laughs> All right, so uh, thank you, Florence, for introducing me to this, uh, uh, this audience. So um, a third uh, is one of my babies. Uh, that I really enjoy working on it. I've been working on it for quite a while. And I just want to maybe start it from about a year ago that I was introduced to the TTP program. And at the time that we had a prototype, a software prototype allow us to use machine learning to summarize the overwhelming alerts that SOC analysts every single day, they're processing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of alerts every single day, try to see what's going on, what kind of incidents should they respond and how would they respond and how do they tell the users and so on and so forth. So we really believe that machine learning should help uh, summarizing these alerts in an unsupervised manner 
into some kind of statistical attack models. We publish papers, and the papers show great results, and they're very unique. Every single one is very unique behavior, and they can help us to predict the future, and so on and so forth. Great. Excellent. Algorithm works well. A lot of theory behind it. Excellent. A lot of these details you can see on the on the on the, my slide where oh this is this model, this that model, this that statistical distribution. Well, those are sounds great, but can they be used? Can they be used by the human infrastructure? So quick forward uh, to today. And a year later, I've been working with uh, very graciously to be able to collaborate with CACR, Omni SOC, and Indiana University to kind of try to deploy our prototype at the time, a year ago, next to the operational environment. It's not in the operational environment because, again, the infrastructure is there, already there, kind of replacing everything is, is not, not, a, not a realistic goal. So it's next to it. And throughout this past, I would say, nine month period of time, we discover a lot, a lot, really a lot. So the academic prototype, first of all, academic prototypes is not a prototype. <laughs> academic prototype that works in a lab, processing uh, some software, uh, some data that actually you grab from some kind of exercises. And even you try to pretend that looks like a live data, they're not live data. They're very different. The variety of scenario attack scenarios, the scale of the scenarios are totally different in the real world operational environment than in a, in a in a data set that although they are already big, but still not big enough, not diverse enough. And also in working with the users, that we discover a lot of different things, including a focus, much more focused value propositions. So the academic papers talk about, oh, we can use a cert to generate these models that can kill you X, Y, Z, right? X, Y, Z could be, could include, oh, you can predict the future. What are future events that could happen? Great, excellent. But first thing they don't even understand is that what is, does this model tell me? Not to mention about the future. So this is actually coincide with our findings earlier that is human has this cognitive process, perception, comprehension, and anticipation. Our work, our research work, academic research work has been focusing on, hey, this kind of summary can help us to do anticipation. But human need to first be able to perceive the model, comprehend the model first. And that we are working on a lot and, and bring that value proposition back to the comprehension portion of it. So we've been developing the correct, better visualization to help the human users to understand the, those features and those use cases. And the other thing we learn a lot is that the partnership, the partnership that, that, that allow us to use a cert to that kind of really to summarize this alert to say, hey, this is how you could use it, this is how you may be using it. So a lot of blind spots that we didn't see, we we're able to discover that through the partnership. So those are, those are great, great experiences. And I also want to echo Patrick's point. A lot of these experiences for me as a PI, for the students, they're, they're really, really invaluable. There's not something that you get to learn in the classroom. they are not something you can learn in the research lab. Either. So excellent. So I don't want to spend like, all the time to talk about what a search spell. I want to share with you detail of some of the lessons learned. So one year in TDP, about one year, probably less than one year, the lessons learned are the follow as follows. First of all, uh, for many of you out there that who has written very good papers, very good improvement of 20%, 50%, 100% in your scientific metrics, great, great results. No doubt about it, just like Patrick said, innovation is great, excellent that doesn't necessarily mean equivalent to the value proposition, right? What can the user gain from using your system, using your software, using your hardware, whatever product you produce? What are the real values present here? And I want to, I want to emphasize that the value here doesn't necessarily mean commercial value, right? You may not, you may not be commercializing your product in TTP, TTP transit practice, you may be making it an open source uh, algorithm, open source software for people to use, but you still need to present value. The value may not be commercial value, it may be just value. But again, that value does not, usually doesn't equal to just good results in your scientific metrics. Second of all, I mean, in my experience, that uh, the expertise and experience in real world development is critical. 
So RIT has great students, and I I'm, have been very fortunate to have some of the best students in software development to help me to revise, revamp TTP, get rid of those uh, spaghetti code and restructure them and so on and so forth. Um, still, I'm very fortunate. However, there's still a difference between academic software prototype versus operational robust prototype that can scale up. So expertise, experience, very important. And the funding, this goes also go to the funding question of uh, issues that uh, Patrick talked about. So be able to support experienced, very experts that can help you develop things, software in a very sophisticated way, robust way, it takes money, it takes time. So very, very difficult there. But not just the uh, development uh, effort, but also the project management effort, the partnership management effort. There's, a, there's issues here that how do you find the right partners? How do you find the first user? How do you find the, the ones that can really honestly and, and critically, but, but uh, helpfully provide feedback to you? In my example, that I really appreciate CSC Omnisoc people, the real analysts, uh, providing me some great feedback, and we have a very uh, great relationship to be able to you know, get those feedback and be able to develop and they're patient with me. Uh, so that's very, very uh, appreciated. Um, the other thing is that I really believe a good interface, and Patrick talked about this as well, a simple, good interface not only works to provide value for the, for the customers, for the users, but also serve as an opportunity to obtain the feedback, the right feedback. If you don't have a good interface, it's hard for people to grasp your scientific advances, your innovations. You don't have that. So, so regular users, so Patrick talked about the, the blue light and the red light, right? Simple, simple enough to get, get it, right? Um, and in, our, in my case, I need a great interface, and I have that now. I need a great interface to get the feedback from the user because what, what do you mean by statistical uh, attack models, right? And until they see a graphical visual representation of what we meant, it's very difficult to get the real feedback. So good interface is not necessarily the end of your, uh, uh, your product, but it is a means to get the right feedback, good feedbacks. Speaking of that, I will tell you that we continuously underestimate the user's need to learn a new tool. Uh, earlier we talked about uh, the, the, the wheels, right? When we have an innovation that is, is, it takes time for the user to understand and appreciate it and comprehending the value, the new value propositions that this new tool, new innovation, what it brings. So it takes time for that. You need a good interface, you need education, you need training, you need to have bi-directional conversation to really un understand the user's needs, to learn how they need, what they need to learn a new tool. I do think that the TTP program helps a lot. It helps not only a lot to bring the research, bring the innovation to the real world, but also helps reveal blind spots. So my, the, this bullet point, I'm really speaking to the researchers out there that a lot of times that we talk to our students, we, we, we look at the literature, we think that here's a one algorithm, here's a one aspect that we can improve, we can get better and so on and so forth. But a lot of times transition to practice itself, the journey itself, help, help us to realize, ha, oh, I've not, never thought about that as something that users care. That is a research opportunity. That is a research challenge that we did not see. We only saw others in the literature. We only saw other things, but we didn't see that aspect. And users may not realize that either, but it's through the conversations, right? Through this interface that you present your stuff to them, they provide feedback to you. Through those dialogue, eventually it helps reveal a lot of great blind spots for additional research opportunities. Uh, well, it's a very long journey. It takes time and requires a lot of resources, money, and patience. Because a lot of times you will see setbacks, right? Uh, you cannot develop a software feature because you don't have the people. You may not have the partner that can give you the right feedback. They have their day jobs, their full-time jobs. Uh, they couldn't really meet with you. So a lot of setbacks require patience, resources, so far, so, so on and so forth. It's really worthwhile and really a lot of fun because you offer real impact. 
So uh, I, Patrick and I, we did not talk to each other when we designed our slides, but I'm really glad that we both are talking about this real world impact, the real fun associated with this, this, uh, this value that we provided to the, to the people. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. And as you can hear, both of these researchers are very impassioned about how they're making the world a better place with their research. And that's what we want to do, by and large, right? And so what we want to do at Trusted CI is to help. <laughs> so um, we've, we've bottled what we've been doing with uh, the cohort this year with Jay and Shantanu, and Shantanu's uh, one of his students. And so we've created this Trusted CI TTP playbook. And this is a resource for self-guided transition to practice planning and execution that you can use on your own. It's safe to use on your own. Um, it has an overview of the Trusted CI TTP program like we've discussed today. Um, it has a section on the goals, something on how to use it well. And then it has two key new resources um, to build a TTP success plan. The TRL assessment, as we discussed, the technical readiness level assessment, and then the TTP canvas, which is a business model canvas, which some of you may have seen. A lot of venture capitalists use it. A lot of startups use it. That's the term now is business model canvas. The i team uses it. If you've ever heard of that at NSF, um, they have a business model canvas. And we've customized it for TTP because not every researcher wants to create a business. You know, Patrick created a business. Um, Jay is on another journey. The, um, the Secure MPC folks up at BU put it in open source. The point is transitioning your research to practice, whether it's into a business, into open source, into you know, a certain user base, um, and then what is the sustainability model to help you get there. And so that's the goal of this playbook, and it's posted um, on trustedci.org slash TTP. And what I'd like to do now, if we can go to the next chart, is um, to hand this over to Ryan Kaiser, who created our TRL assessment tool. Ryan? Hi, uh, thanks. This has actually been really, really great uh, to hear from everyone here. Um, I've been working with Jay now for the better part of a year uh, on a cert at CACR, and uh, watching his progress has been um, excellent. So it's, it's great to hear uh, again from him that this is working out for him. Um, I'm going to run through a lot of material about the TRO fairly quickly uh, in the interest of time. Um, but these materials are up on our website at trustedci.org slash TTP. And if you have any questions or comments about anything that is up there uh, or anything in these slides, uh, p please feel free to reach out to us at TTP at trustedci.org. Um, so the TRL assessment tool, uh, TRL came out of NASA in the mid-1970s. And the problem that they were trying to solve with it was that uh, they had spent tons of time engineering, planning, and assembling these big, expensive, complicated things to try and launch something into space, only to occasionally end up with rocket parts kind of strewn all over the uh, desert in Texas because a particular part failed. It was not ready to the level of everything else uh, in that big, huge, complicated assembly. Um, so rockets are big engineering projects with lots of different people and organizations involved in contributing to the construction of them um, and flight ready meant different things to different people. So they needed a way to come up with a standard to describe the maturity of those parts to be able to determine the maturity of the whole. So next slide. TRO encapsulates the life cycle of an R&D project from basic research idea through successful operations. And you can kind of break it down into these three stages. You have research, development, and deployment. The research is the part where you're coming up with an idea and testing the idea. Deployment being where you scale it up to prove it still works in different environments. And then deployment is where you're producing the thing and proving it actually solves the problem that is supposed to in the real world. And next slide. Uh, so the we're probably not going to be launching a lot of stuff into space in the security world. Uh, sometimes, usually not though. Uh, we found through working with our cohort members, Jay and Sean New, that the full NASA TRL uh, was a little bit cumbersome and sometimes didn't quite seem appropriate. Uh, so we made some adaptations to it and this is uh, what we have. We produced a tool um, based on these seven levels that we came up with and the adaptations that we made. Uh, next slide. 
So that tool is the TRL worksheet. Those seven levels provide the foundation for this. Uh, this is a tool which can be used to identify the components of a system which are most in need of attention in order to further mature the whole. And this uh, gives you a way to identify distinct subsystems which provide necessary functionality and the maturity of the individual components of those subsystems. Um, as a side note, I did an assessment of a hypothetical web application as a thought exercise um, to produce an example. You can find that on our website at the URL I mentioned before, trustedci.org slash TTP. Uh, if you want to see the, the full uh, source of the next example that I'm going to cover in the next slide. Um, so this hypothetical system has three different subsystems. It's a web application that is made up of a web interface, a data management layer, and then some piece of core software that provides the actual functionality that, uh, that is the subject of the research prototype. Um, in reality, core software would probably have multiple subsystems itself, and it would be better to identify those, but this is supposed to be a simple example, so I just cut it off at three. So next slide. So this, uh, in this case, we're showing three of the different components of the web interface subsystem. Um, so there's the web server itself, uh, HTTPD, uh, which is widely used everywhere. So the TRL level for that is seven or maybe even off the scale. Um, it's out in the world, it's been out in the world a lot. It's been deployed in lots of places and used for lots of different things. HTTPD is pretty mature. Uh, the API endpoint is, a uh, custom module that is written in order to provide uh, the API. Um, and that's probably not complete yet. Uh, so the, the explanation here is that basic API calls have been tested successfully, but there's more stuff uh, that still needs to, to, to be done in order to make it into something that's complete. So that gets a four. And you can sort of see as you go through your different components, you assess them individually to come up with a something like an estimate of how mature they are, assign them a TRL according to the definitions that are provided in the worksheet that is uh, on our website. And that provides you with a um, set. Um, I'm not going to cover how to perform the assessment in detail. It is described in the worksheet and it is described in the playbook. And we're happy to work with people, with uh, anyone who is interested in uh, performing this kind of assessment, um, just reach out to us again at ttp at trustedci.org and we can uh, help you along the way. And I think now Florence is on to the other tool that we produced, the TTP Canvas. Exactly. Thank you, Ryan. That was very helpful. Thank you for doing all that for us and creating it from scratch, basically, or from a, a NASA base, but customizing it, which is really what these tools are about. You know, Ryan customized the TRL tool that you may have used in NASA or DOD environments or other environments for TTP to simplify it as appropriate and make it focus for transition to practice of research, specifically cybersecurity where we work. Um, and the same thing with this TTP Canvas. And so, as I mentioned before, um, you can Google Business Model Canvas, ICOR Business Model Canvas, and see some of these canvases. And most of them start out with who's the target client, who are your key partners. When you look at transition to practice of research, what we learned from our TTP cohort, especially Jay and Shantanu, is first, it's usually that they're focused on a research problem. They've been doing research. They've been doing research a long time. They're very good at it. They've probably had a number of grants. And they have a research problem they're trying to address, to do something better, to do something faster, to do something differently, a new innovation. So we've customized this canvas from the researcher's perspective. So first, you know, to get on the table, what is the research problem you're trying to address? Then what are the technology innovations you plan on delivering through this research? And it could be technology innovations you've already already developed through the research. It could be the ones you have planned. What are the technology innovations that you've done or are planning? Well, thank you very much for moving the cursor. Very nice, Jay. Then we go up to target users and customers. So that's when we say, so who could possibly use this? Who could this bring value to? And it could be at a category level. It could be higher ed. It could be industry. It could be government. It could be, you know, security analysts. It could be, you know, um, 
companies with credit card holders, you know, or credit card readers. So it, it's really getting specific who could use it. Then understanding from the user perspective, remember the human, you know, like even at DEF CON, I spoke at DEF CON, they call us humans. And then human plus, if you are if you do a little bit more, we're all the humans. How are the humans going to interface with this? What are their operational challenges? And then what value would it deliver to address those challenges? Then number six is the activities to deliver the value. And there are a whole bunch of examples in the TTP playbook um, and then number seven is the resource required for those activities you know think of some of the things that Patrick and Jay talked about you know the software program and the hardware development who's going to do that or, or doing customer discovery how are you going to figure out what the clients want who's going to do subject matter expert interviews and ask them is it you is it someone else is it a student in the business school is it a partner is it someone you you know you work with um, the resources required to get it done and then the funding model to support the resources and so this is a very high level view there's more detail on our website and in the playbook if we go to the next chart this is actually um, we're very grateful that Jay has done an excellent job of filling this in for a cert so if I could just like you know uh, look uh, look at it very at a very high level you know he starts with his research problem in the top left like he was sharing then his technology innovations you know unsupervised ML with non you know parametric feature distributions from streaming data then he gets to the target users okay SOC analysts and operations management what are their challenges like he was saying too many alerts too little time you know, like when we worked on the b1 in the 1970s same thing with the humans there way too much data coming in so we had to deploy basically ai ml way back then now it's cybersecurity that has that challenge and so what do we do about it then his value delivered he saves them time they get valuable insights references to alerts that are related to the same attack behavior. And part of this is by talking to the users and saying, what would be most valuable for you? You know, and what do we get out of this? And then the activities to deliver the value, the resources required, and the funding model. And then the resources required, you know, there's just looking at yourself and saying, well, if I just have me, what can I get done? But then there's the outside in view of, what resources did I need, do I need to really do these activities to deliver this value, and then how do I get them? And that's really what resources required in the funding model is about. And so this is available, all these charts will be available on the website, so you'll be able to get to them. Thank you, Jay. Next chart, please. So um, we have this trusted CI cybersecurity TTP cohort, and it's a group of cybersecurity researchers sharing TTP success, challenges, learnings, best practices, refer to success. Um, we provide uh, TRL coaching, uh, TTP Canvas, sustainability model and business model coaching, and we have monthly cohort collaboration calls. So we can share learnings and all sorts of stuff. Next chart, please. And so what we'd like to do is invite you to join us. <laughs> so um, we're considering our next steps and the future TTP cohort coaching and program plan, um, including the TRL, the Canvas coaching, and perhaps um, more of a focused program on building a TTP sustainability strategy strategy. So if you're interested in joining the TTP cohort, we welcome you to send us an email at ttp at trustedci.org. But before we go to the next chart and the Q&A, we're going to put a poll up. And Jeanette, if you could graciously uh, do the poll. And we'd like to know for those of you joining us today, um, if, if you could answer the poll, are you interested in potentially joining the Trusted CI TTP cohort? There's no cost, by the way. <laughs> It's, it's free, your tax dollars at work, as we say. Uh, you have to spend time, though, to get the benefit out of it. Are you interested in TTP TRL assessment coaching, TTP Canvas coaching, including value prop, building a sustainability strategy, or all the above? And you can answer as many of these as you want. Because we're trying to get a feel of what we can do to better help you going forward. You know, we created the cohort program. We, um, we've gotten, you know, good value out of it, you know, for Jay and Shantanu. And we'd like to provide more value um, at a broader scale. So uh, we really appreciate you answering this question for us. And so uh, if you go to the next chart, Jay, I think we're ready for our questions. Jeanette, do you have anything you wanted to uh, bring up? And I think we'll give people another minute to answer the poll if they'd like. Any other uh, things before I answer, we get to the questions? Yes, uh, please take our survey. Uh, we appreciate the feedback about your experience and we also look for um, suggestions for more presentations. So I'm throwing up a few, a few uh, things here. Um, 
So I've got uh, the, trust, the TTP at trustedci.org uh, email address. I've got our survey link here. And then it, if you could go to the next slide, I'll just quickly uh, summarize some things that are, that are going on with uh, Trusted CI, and then we'll go through the questions. Uh, first, we have our next office hour in, uh, for the August session. That will be Monday. Uh, the 17th at 11 a.m. Eastern, and Trusted CI Director Vaughn Welch will be uh, overseeing this office hour. So if you have questions for Vaughn, we, we'd love to see you. Uh, our next webinar is Researcher Passport with, um, with Libby, Libby Hemphill, and that's Monday the 28th at 11 a.m. Eastern. I'll be sending out registration for that soon. And then we have the uh, NSF, the C Trusted CI NSF Cybersecurity Summit. Uh, it will be held online this year, but registration is open and it is free. So we would like you to participate. Uh, you can go to trustedci.org slash summit for more information. And we've got a few questions queued up here. So Florence, are you ready to start reading through them? I am, thank you so much, Jeanette. So the first question was, if my goal is commercialization, uh, Heng Yin brought this up, which program should I choose, TTP or SBIR, and what are the major differences? So actually there are even more than TTP and SBIR. There's trans TTP, there's SBIR, there's uh, STTR, which is more the technology transfer side of, of SBIR, small business innovation research. STTR um, is the technology transfer element in particular. Then there's something else called PFI or partnerships for innovation. They all have different rules. Um, some of them require a partner um, to be associated. You know, it could be an industry partner or another. So um, I encourage you to look at each of them and see what makes sense for you from the timing perspective, the dollar amount perspective, um, and the partnership perspective. Patrick, do you want to um, comment on that at all since you've looked at both of those as well? Uh, yeah, so the traditional explanation I've always had was that TTP is um, you have some nice academic results and you really want to get the early pieces uh, uh, together um, so that you might actually approach a real prototype that people want to use and that SBIR is often about scale up. You might have an initial customer in mind. Um, you've already started some early conversations. Um, my first startup, um, we won phases one and two um, SBIR. Uh, way back in 2011. Uh, so, but that said, back to my slides, I, I have not had success with TTP. Um, and so uh, my view may not be perfect. But everybody's journey is different. And that was, all of your insight is very valuable, Patrick. Thank you. Okay, Jay, you spoke about visualization of data. What tool are you using for the visualization? Example, Alteryx, Tableau, et cetera. Uh, thank you for the question. So it's uh, my answer will be a little bit more convoluted. I'll try to keep it simple. Uh, it really, so our own visualization that's being researched, we are uh, grabbing several uh, advantages from the ones you listed, uh, as well as some customized kind of uh, uh, spatial ways to representing our attack models. Uh, and, and the rationale behind that is because that some of the insights we want to show is not just about a plot, a table, uh, it's about how the users is going to interact with the system. Okay. Uh, having said that, that uh, our current uh, user is using Kibana. So Elasticstack, Elasticsearch, all, the, all that whole package. Kibana is that visualization, is the visualization of that package. So we also try to see whether we can leverage Kibana, which is not as, in our opinion, different people may have different opinion, uh, as easy to use than some other tools that can develop. Um, so to, the answer is not like one is probably a combination of different things that we try to develop. Very good, thank you very much, Jay. And then the final question so far is, would it be possible to share some successful proposals? So that's a very personal question, I think, <laughs> that every human gets to choose. Um, to be honest, when we were planning this webinar, I went to the NSF Simple Search and did a simple search on SATC and TTP and invited 830 people to this, 834 after we deduped the list. Um, so there are, a lot of examples out there of um, TTP or SBIR or PFI types of um, proposals that have been successful. 
What might be interesting is if you go there and look for some in, in a topical area that's in, that seems kind of similar to what you're thinking, that might be the most helpful for you. Um, you know, like we heard two different stories today, you know, hardware, software, and services from Skin Reaper and AI and ML software and services from Jay, you know, two different type of targets all about cybersecurity. So um, I would say, you know, maybe looking there, if you'd like some help with that, you know, I'm happy to help you look for them. Um, this is Florence. You could just send an email to ttp at trustedci.org. And I invite um, my colleagues on the phone if anybody else wants to make a comment about that. I'll just echo what Florence said. The uh, NSF website is a good resource for finding those. Yeah. There are a whole bunch of them from over the years, if you're flexible with the number of years. Okay, great. I think that's uh, the last question. Does anyone see anything I missed? I don't think so. Nope. It, last call for questions. And I'll uh, just uh, let people type. Uh, any any wrap up comments, Florence, Patrick, Ryan, Jay? Thank you so much for presenting. Anything else you want to add? Big thanks for the journey that Patrick and Jay have taken, and for sharing it so openly and honestly with us. It's very helpful. I love your clarity, and um, I love your success and your interest and passion to continue. And of course, for Ryan for being my partner in uh, in this work that we've been doing. Any other comments? Uh this is Jay, uh, if you don't mind me uh, having a comment. So I think that uh, for the audience of this call, that if you're thinking about transition to practice, there are two questions. I want to simplify the two questions for you to think about at the current stage. One is that what do you want to get out of it, right? Mm -hmm. What do you really want to get out of this? Is seeing your research to be used by real people to make money, to commercialize, whatever that thing is that you want to ask yourself that question. What do you want to get out of it? Uh, second is that uh, I, I, I would like to you to ask yourself is that what do you think that um, you need immediately, right? So do you want to use the TRL assessment to assess where your prototype currently stand? Do you want to uh, someone to help evaluate your value proposition? What is the one thing that you immediately need? Uh, so I think that will be help, helpful for you to say, one is the longer term goal, what do you want to get out of it, and what do you need to go the right way? Very well said. Thank you, Jay. Any other comments, team? Okay. I would just say, go get them. <laughs> and if we can help, please let us know. And thank you very much for your interest. And Jeanette, thank you so much for spearheading this, as always. You do a great job on our webinars. Thank you. Um, Everybody, thank you everybody for presenting. Thank you everyone who attended. I will be cutting a, a video of this later today and uh, we'll be sharing it on our uh, mailing list. Uh, but also you can find our, uh, our videos at trustedci.org slash webinars. And with that, I will close this presentation. Thank you everyone again and uh, see you next time. <laughs>